Welcome back. Um, in my previous uh, video, uh, I talked about latches. Okay, so we have seen latches uh, as an important memory element. We also have seen the drawback of latches. Uh, we have a better, in this video, I'm going to talk about flip flops. So flip flops are a better memory element, which are used in sequential, in synchronous sequential circuits. So let's get started. So a flip-flop is a better memory element for synchronous sequential circuits, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, it solves the problem of latches. The difference between a latch and a flip-flop is that the latch is sensitive to the level of the clock. So we have seen in uh, a previous uh, video that uh, you can actually have the clock to enable, you can actually enable uh, the latch, okay, by having the clock as an enable input. And as long as the clock is high, okay, then the, um, then the latch will be enabled. And when the clock becomes low, then the uh, latch will be disabled. So we say that the latch is sensitive to the level of the clock. On the other hand, the flip-flop is a different memory element. It is sensitive to the edge of the clock. So we have the clock has a level, also it has edges. It has a rising edge, it also has a falling edge. So the rising edge, it means that the clock is, jumps from zero to one, that's the rising edge. The falling edge, it means that the clock goes from one down to zero. So we can design the memory element to be sensitive to the edge of the clock. So it will change its value only at the edge of the clock, okay? It does not change the value, okay, when the clock is high. Okay, as we have seen in the case of, la of latches. So this is the main difference between flip-flop and latches. Okay, so let us see how we can implement flip-flops. Okay, so um, how do we implement flip-flops? We can implement a flip-flop using two latches. Okay, so the first latch is called the master's latch, and the second latch is called the slave latch, as shown in this slide. So master here is a latch. Notice that the master is a D-type latch, whereas slave is a set reset. It's an SR type of a latch. So we have two latches, master and slave. Now, the trick here is to enable only one of them at a given point in time. Okay, so if one of them is enabled, the other one should be disabled. So only one of them will be enabled at any point in time. So suppose that I would like to build a D flip-flop. So the D flip-flop will have two latches, as shown here. This is what we call the master slave configuration. So this is my D input here to the, uh, to the first latch, which is the master latch. It will also have a clock input. Now, we can invert the clock before connecting it to the C input of the master. In other words, if the clock is equal to zero, if my clock input equal to zero, then the master C input will be equal to one, and therefore the master will be enabled. So as long as the clock is zero, the master will be enabled. At the same time, the C input of the slave will be equal to zero. So the C input of the slave will be just simply the same as a clock and therefore it will be disabled. So when the master is enabled, when the C input of the master is equal to one, the C input of the slave will be equal to zero. So the master is enabled, the slave will be disabled. Now when the master is enabled, its output QM and the QM bar, this is basically the Q output okay, of the master. I'm calling it QM to indicate that this is the Q output of the master latch. Okay, so M here stands for master. So the QM here, which is the output of the master latch, will follow D as long as the C input is equal to one. In other words, when a clock equal to zero, the master will be enabled and the QM is going to follow D. However, when a clock is equal to one, okay, then the C input of the master will be equal to zero, the master will be disabled, and the slave will be enabled. So any change in D will not appear in a QM because the master will be disabled. So there is no change in a Q and a QM bar. 
So now the slave is going to change its output Q and Q bar. This is the output of the slave, which is also the output of the entire flip-flop. Then the slave is going to change its output according to QM and QM bar. So Q becomes QM and Q bar will become QM bar. This is the case when the clock becomes 1, the slave will be enabled. So really, the change in the state will happen when the clock goes from 0 to 1. So only when the clock jumps from 0 to 1, we disable the master, we enable the slave, and the slave is going to output whatever is the value which was output by the master. And there is no change. The master will be disabled. So therefore, there is no change in the QM and the QM bar, even when there are changes in the D input. So this is a great. Okay, this way we can uh, implement an edge triggered D flip-flop. So the changes in the Q and the Q bar will take place when the clock goes from zero to one. This is when we disable the master and enable the slave. We can implement a negative edge trigger D flip-flop by connecting the clock input to the C input of the master. And of course, we can use an inverter okay, to take the complement of the clock and connect it to the C input of the slave. So when the clock is equal to 1, the master will be enabled and the QM will follow D. So whatever changes in D will happen at the output of the master. Okay, so that's when the clock is equal to 1. When the clock changes to 0, the master will be disabled, the slave will be enabled, and therefore the output here, Q and Q bar, will be the same as the value of a QM and a QM bar. So really the change in the output Q and the Q bar will take place when the clock goes from 1 down to 0. This is the moment in time when the master is disabled and the slave is enabled. Notice that any change in D, when the master is disabled, it will not change the QM and the QM bar. So even though when we have D is changing, there is no change in the Q and the Q bar. So the change will only happen at the edge of the clock, at the negative edge of the clock, when the clock goes from 1 down to 0. To have a good understanding of flip-flops, we have to look at the timing diagram. The timing diagram shows how the, uh, the inputs and the outputs are changing over time. So here, CLK is my clock input. Clock here is just a periodic signal that will actually change between 0 and 1. It's going to alternate, it's going to toggle between 0 and 1. D here is my data input. Okay, So that's here an arbitrary waveform for my D input. Now QM is the output of the master latch, whereas Q is the output of the slave, which is the output of the D flip-flop. Now the D flip-flop can be either positive edge or negative edge. So here in this timing diagram, I'm looking at the positive edge D flip-flop. So this is actually is a positive edge D flip-flop. That's the timing diagram of a positive edge D flip-flop. Now, in the case of a positive edge, okay, Q, the master will be enabled when the clock is low. Okay, so when the clock CLK here, my clock input is low, this is when the master will be enabled. So notice that QM here is going to change according to D. So when D goes here from 0 to 1, jumps to 1 here, you can see that QM, QM this is the output of the master, is going to jump to 1. Okay, uh, as long as clock is low. Notice that when the clock is high, there is no change in the QM. Okay, even though the D is changing, there is no change in the QM because the master latch is disabled. Uh, when it is enabled again, when the clock is low, then it will be enabled again. So, for example, here you can see that the clock is low here, right? Then when D here goes from 0 to 1, okay, when it jumps from 0 to 1, you can see that how QM is jumping from 0 to 1, okay? Notice that before that, when the clock was high, okay, there was no change in the QM. Only when the clock went to low, jumped actually here to 0, okay, then 
you can see there is a change in the output QM uh, and, and so on. So you can actually just check here the value of a QM. As long as the Q is high, there is no change. So for example, here when the clock is high, there is no change in a QM, even though the D is changing, but the QM is not changing. But when the clock is low, then QM is going to follow D. So when D goes drops to zero, then QM is going to drop to zero. Notice that there is a small delay, okay, between QM and D. This is because of the delay inside the latch. Remember that the latch is implemented using gates. Gates have delays, and therefore there is a delay. So the output QM is delayed. I'm shifting QM slightly to the right because there is a delay in the master latch. Okay. Now let us take a look at Q. Q is the output of the slave latch. This is the final output of the flip-flop. This is the output of the flip-flop. So now we can say that what is the Q? Q will change when the slave is enabled. The slave will be enabled when the clock is high. So therefore, when the clock is low, there is no change in the Q. So suppose that the initial value of the Q was zero, it's going to remain zero as long as clock is equal to zero. So when clock equal to zero, the slave will be disabled and there is no change in the Q. However, when clock is high, then we are going to have a Q changing according to the value of a QM. So basically Q becomes a QM, okay, when the clock is high. There is no change in a Q when a clock is, is low. However, there is a change when the clock is high. Notice that QM is changing here when the clock is low, but there is no change in a Q. Okay, that's because the slave is disabled, okay, when the clock is low. Whereas here, okay, uh, when the clock is high, Q becomes QM. So notice that even though here we have a negative pulse, okay, in a QM, it does not really appear in the output Q, okay, because the uh, slave latch is disabled. Okay, so that actually explains that how we get the output Q. Okay, so the output Q is the output of the flip-flop, which is the output of the slave latch. Now you can get it directly from the, um, without knowing even a QM, you can obtain it directly from the D and from the clock. Let me just quickly erase what I have done here, okay, with an eraser. Let me erase all of the, uh, here, highlighter, okay. So forget about the QM now. Let us focus on the clock and focus on the output Q. I can get the output Q directly from the D and from the clock, even without knowing what's the value of QM. So how do we get this without knowing what's the value of a QM? The answer is simple, okay? In order to get, okay, I'm going to switch back to the highlighter now. In order to know what's the output of Q, just look at the rising edge because this is a positive edge. Just look at the rising edges of the, all the rising edges of the clock and see the value of D just here at the rising edge of the clock. Just look at the value of D. Now notice that the value of D is one, okay, at the rising edge. So therefore the Q must actually go from zero to one, of course, after a short delay, okay, and this is the delay inside the gates, okay, that are used to implement the flip-flop. So, there is a small delay here, okay, but you get exactly one, okay, just after the rising edge. Now, notice that even though the clock is high and D is changing, there is no change in the Q. This is perfect. So, therefore, this is why we say that the flip-flop is an edge triggered. So, therefore, it changes its value at the edge of the clock. And here we are using the positive edge, the rising edge. Notice that here the value of D is 1 just before the rising edge, so therefore we keep the value of Q to be 1. Okay. Notice that the value of here D is 1 just before the rising edge, so therefore the value of Q will remain 1. So there is no change in the value of Q. Notice that the value of D is just 0 just before the arrival of the next rising edge. So therefore the value of Q is going to drop just after the rising edge. So the changes in a Q will happen 
immediately after the rising edge of the clock. Notice that the value of D here is 1 before the next arrival of the rising edge. So therefore, Q is going to jump to 1 just immediately after the rising edge of the clock. The delay exists here in the slave uh, uh, latch inside the flip-flop. Okay, so it's always delayed a little bit actually by a small amount, but you see this delay is actually from the rising edge until you get the output Q. Okay, this is an important timing parameter for a D flip-flop. Now, this is the graphic symbol for a flip-flop, for a, a D flip-flop. Notice that here D stands for data. The flip-flop is just going to store one bit. So all of this flip-flop, it is just for storing a single bit either a one or a zero. That's the flip-flop. Okay, so Q will be the, uh, out, the output of the flip-flop. It means the value which is stored inside the flip-flop and Q bar is just the complement of Q. You can actually have a positive edge or you can have a negative edge. Notice that here, the arrowhead, okay, um, at the clock input. So this indicates that changes in a Q and a Q bar will appear at the edge of the clock. Notice that there is no bubble, there is no circle, so therefore we are using the rising edge of the clock, whereas here we are using a bubble at the clock input indicating the falling edge. So this flip-flop is using the negative edge or the falling edge of the clock, whereas the first one is using the rising edge. How do I know this? I can see there is a circle okay, at the clock input indicating that we are using the falling edge. How do I know this is a flip-flop, not a latch, because this is actually there is an arrowhead here. So this arrowhead indicates that we are using the edge of the clock, not the level of the clock, to change the value of a Q and a Q bar. This is the main difference between okay, the flip-flop and the latch. When a flip-flop is powered, its initial state is unknown. I don't know what is the exact value which is stored or what is the exact output of the flip-flop. What's the value of a Q and what is the value of a Q bar? It's important to initialize uh, memory elements exactly the same way that we initialize variables in software. So when we, uh, when we start, when we power on the circuit, it's very important to initialize the memory elements. So how do we do this? We can use special inputs here, which are called the preset and the clear. So what the preset input does is that it's going to initialize the output Q to 1 and Q bar will be 0. Now notice that the preset input here is active low. It's shown here as active low. Notice that the small circle at the input indicates that we preset, okay, when the preset input is equal to 1 and the clear, when the preset input equal to 0 and the clear is equal to 1. Okay, that means the preset input. Now, this preset input is asynchronous. It means that we don't wait for the clock. The data can be anything. We don't really care about the data input and we don't really care about the clock. This is the meaning of asynchronous. We don't really wait for the edge of the clock to initialize the flip-flop, okay, to set its output to Q. We also have uh, a clear input which is shown here, which is also active low. So when clear equal to zero and preset is equal to one, then in this case, I would like to clear, okay, the flip-flop. So the output Q will be equal to zero and Q bar will be equal to one. This is my clear operation. So this is going to clear the flip-flop. So I can clear all the flip-flops inside, okay, my circuit. Uh, again, the clear uh, input is asynchronous. It does not depend on the data and it does not depend on the clock. We should never uh, uh, preset and the clear at the same time. Okay, then in this case, the Q and the Q bar output will be undefined. So think about the preset as my set input and think about the clear as my reset input. And these are asynchronous and they do not really wait for the clock. Now, if a preset and the clear are both one and one, then in this case, we use the normal operation of the flip-flop. Okay, so when they are both and one and one, it means I'm not presetting, I'm not clearing, uh, 
So we have the normal operation of the flip-flop. So if the data equal to zero, we wait for the rising edge of the clock, then therefore the output Q will be zero and the Q bar will be equal to one. And if the data is equal to one, we wait for the rising edge of the clock, then the output Q is going to follow the data, the, the D input, okay, at the rising edge of the clock, and of course Q bar will be just the complement. So this is the meaning of the asynchronous preset and the clear. This slide shows a gate level implementation of a D flip-flop with asynchronous preset and clear using the master slave configuration. So the D flip-flop has uh, a D input here. This is the data input and also it has a clock. So therefore remember that all the changes will happen at the edge of the clock. So this D flip-flop uses the rising edge of the clock. Okay, for it to change Q and Q bar. So uh, notice that the master latch is a D latch, whereas the slave latch is an SR latch. Now the output of the master latch is called the QM and the QM bar. Okay, where M here stands for the master, whereas the output of the slave latch is called the Q and Q bar. Okay, which is also the output of the entire flip flop. Now, the clock here is inverted, so CM here is the clock enable for the master latch, whereas CS here is the clock enable of, of the slave latch. The, uh, the D flip-flop has an asynchronous preset and the clear inputs, okay, which are connected to the output gates, okay, you can see here the output NAND gates here are three input NAND gates, okay, for the slave as well as in the master. So the preset here is connected directly to the slave latch. So when the slave is disabled, okay, then if the preset here equal to zero, if the preset equal to zero, then the Q output will be automatically equal to one. Now, when the Q is equal to one, you will get Q bar equal to zero, and that's a preset operation uh, when the slave latch is disabled. If the slave latch is enabled, then we also connect the preset input, okay, to this uh, uh, three input NAND gate to force QM to become one and QM bar to become zero. And because the slave is enabled, then Q and the Q bar are going to follow QM and the QM bar. So this way we can preset, okay? And this is regardless, without waiting, okay, for the edge of the clock. So this is why it's called an asynchronous preset. The same thing can be set for clear. So in the case of a clear, if the slave latch is disabled, <clears throat> so the clear here is active low. So when it is zero and here we have a NAND gate, this is going to force a Q bar to be equal to one. <clears throat> And therefore, if a Q bar is equal to one and all these three inputs of this uh, top NAND gate are all equal to one, then therefore Q will be equal to zero. So therefore, we are going to clear Q. So Q will be equal to zero and the Q bar will be equal to one. That's my asynchronous clear. Okay, so this would work if the slave latch is disabled. But if the slave latch is enabled, the master latch will be disabled, and therefore we have to connect also clear to this three input NAND gate at the output of the master latch to force a QM bar to become one and the QM to become zero. <clears throat> so if the slave latch is enabled, then Q and the Q bar will be simply a copy of a QM and the QM bar, and this will is going to clear okay, the output of the flip-flop. So this is how we can achieve asynchronous and preset clear by, uh, by connecting okay, the preset and the clear inputs to the, uh, uh, to the NAND gates that appear at the output Q, Q bar, as well as a QM and a QM bar. Now, D flip-flops are used today okay, in registers and counters. I'll talk about this later. Uh, they are implemented efficiently using transistors in modern CMOS technology. This is only a gate level representation of the D flip-flop, but in reality they are implemented using transistors.
Now it's enough to have the D flip flop, okay? To actually to build any synchronous sequential circuit, the D flip flop is sufficient. But it's important to talk here, or it's worthy to note uh, that there are other types of flip flops. Okay, so although the D flip flop, the D flip flop is the most commonly used type, there are also other types. We have the JK flip flop. So the JK flip flop, okay, has two inputs here, J and K. It's also implemented a master slave configuration. Okay, so the master latch here is an SR latch. The slave is also an SR latch. So the J and the K are basically connected to the S and the R inputs of the master latch. It's like actually, so the J here corresponds to a set and K corresponds to a reset. So we have here, okay, so if J is equal to one and K equal to zero, then it will be a set operation. And of course, the value of a Q and a Q bar will take place at the rising edge of the clock. If J is equal to zero and K is equal to one, then it will be a reset. And if J is equal to zero and K equal to zero, then there is no change in Q and Q bar. The interesting thing is that when J is equal to one and K is equal to one, remember that in the case of an SR latch, we said that actually S and R should never be one and one at the same time. Now notice that when both J and K are equal to one and one, I'm connecting Q bar here back to S and I'm connecting Q back here to R. So this means that, okay, if J and K are both equal to one and one, we are going to complement the value of a Q and a Q bar at the rising edge of the clock. So therefore we say that this is actually, we are inverting the outputs and we call this a toggle operation. So therefore we toggle, it means that we invert a Q and a Q bar at the edge of the clock when J and K are equal to one and one. So input here one one is allowed in the case of a JK flip flop. Okay. And therefore we simply, okay, make S is equal to Q bar and R is equal to Q. So this will invert Q and Q bar at the next edge of the clock. Another important flip flop is called the T flip flop, which is called the toggle flip flop. Notice that the toggle flip flop can be implemented using a JK flip flop by connecting the same T input to J and K. So we'll always toggle. So either you have actually zero, zero, or you have one, one. So when T is equal to zero, there is no toggling. There is no change in a Q and a Q bar. When T is equal to one, then J and K are both equal to one and one. Therefore, we toggle the value of Q and a Q bar. In other words, we invert Q and we invert Q bar, okay? We can also implement it using a D flip flop and XOR gate. Notice that this output here is a Q, I'm not, it's not shown, but that's actually the Q output. So the Q output is XORed with the T input. So if T is equal to zero, we get D is equal to Q and therefore there is no change in the output of Q. But if T is equal to one, then basically we are XORing with one. So Q XOR one becomes Q prime or Q bar. So therefore then the next value so we're going to invert the Q, but we inverted at the edge of the clock, okay? Only at the edge, the rising edge of the clock. So that's here is an implementation of a T flip flop using a D flip flop and XOR gate. And this is the graphic symbol for a T flip flop. Notice the T input, the clock input, and we have two outputs Q and Q bar. Now we can describe these flip flops okay, with a, a characteristic table, okay? We can actually really understand this. This characteristic table is very easy to understand. The D flip-flop is the simplest type of flip-flop and it's the most common type of flip-flop. In fact, in this course, in later presentations, I'm going to focus only on the D flip-flop. So the characteristic table is very simple. Notice that here we have the input D, I have here the output, which is a Q at T plus one. When I mean here t plus one, it means that this is the next value of a q, the next value at the edge of the clock. So at the edge of the clock, we change the value of a q. So if d is equal to zero, then q at t plus one becomes zero. That's my reset operation. And if d is equal to one, then q at t plus one becomes one. This is my set operation. So basically q at t plus one will follow d is going to change at, uh, at the rising edge of the clock, okay? In the case of JK, it's slightly more complex. 
because j k we have here two inputs j and k so we have four possible combinations zero zero it means there is no change q at t plus one is q t notice that q t is the current value of q now okay during this clock cycle q at t plus one it means that this will be the next value of q during next clock cycle the change will happen at the edge of the clock so zero zero means there is no change q t plus one is equal to q t zero one that's a reset so q t plus one becomes zero one zero means a set it becomes one and one one basically we are inverting so q t plus one becomes the complement of a q t okay so it's q prime t so we are just toggling the value of okay q so that's q prime that's the complement of q okay in the case of t it's called actually t because actually it will toggle the value of a q so t equal to zero it means there is no change we don't toggle so q at t plus one is equal to q t and one means that we are complementing so q at t plus one is equal to q prime t we can define the operation of a flip-flop by writing a characteristic equation so in the case of a d flip-flop the characteristic equation is very simple okay so we can write it like this q at t plus one this is the mean so this means that the value of a q during next clock cycle so when i say t plus one it means that after the edge of the clock when we change the value of a q so q at t plus one is simply equal to the d input so if d is equal to zero you get q is equal to zero q at t plus one will be equal to zero if d is equal to one you get q at t plus one is equal to one as described in the characteristic table for the d flip-flop in the case of the jk flip-flop q at t plus one is the characteristic equation is slightly more complex it is described by this equation so it is j and q prime t or k prime and q t now we have four possible values for j and k so if j equal to zero and k equal to zero so j equal to zero the first term will be equal to zero when k equal to zero k prime will be equal to one so this will give me qt so q at t plus one is equal to qt and there is no change in the output q when j equal to zero and k is equal to one okay then the first term will be equal to zero and the second term will also be equal to zero so therefore we get qt q at t plus one will be equal to zero so this is will be my reset operation when j is equal to one and when j is equal to one and k equal to zero okay then uh, we get here q prime or q q prime or q is always equal to one and this is my set operation and finally when we have j equal to one and k is equal to one when j is equal to one the first term will be q prime of t whereas the second term will be equal to zero so th so therefore q at t plus one will be q prime of of t and therefore we are going to complement the output during the next clock cycle now for a t flip-flop the characteristic equation is simpler okay it's given by this third equation it is t xor q of t so if t is equal to zero okay then q at t plus one is simply equal to q t and there is no change in the output whereas if t is equal to one so when you XOR with one you get q prime of t and therefore we are going to toggle or complement the output during the next clock cycle so this is how we can describe or we can define the operation of a flip-flop using characteristic equations so these characteristic equations are simply a description of the characteristic tables okay to ensure the proper operation of flip-flops there are two important timing parameters that we should really consider and understand the first one is called the setup time so what's the meaning of the set the first one is called the setup time or ts for short and the second one is called the whole time or th so what's the meaning of ts and th i'm showing here the clock signal okay the clock signal is shown in blue the clock signal has a 
a rising edge, which is shown here in red. Notice that the, it takes a short amount of time for the clock to go from 0 to 1. So the rising edge has a rise time. And there is also a falling edge, okay, where the clock will drop from 1 down to 0. But the focus will be on the rising edge. I'm assuming that all the flip-flops that I'm using use the rising edge, which is the positive edge of the clock. So what's the meaning of TS and TH? Now, the meaning of TS, it means that the data, okay, which is the input, the D input to the flip-flop must be valid and it must be stable before the arrival of the rising edge of the clock. So during this TS, okay, period of time, the data must be valid and it must be stable. It must not really change. Now, what's the meaning of TH? TH means that this is the whole time. It means that the data must hold even after the arrival of the rising edge of the clock. So TS means that the data is valid and stable before the arrival of the clock edge, whereas TH, it means that the data must continue okay, to be stable and it must not change even after okay, the arrival of the clock edge. So during this period of time, so during TS and TH, the data must not change. Now you will say that why not? Why not actually allowing the data to change? The reason why is that the, uh, the flip-flop okay, has internal gates and these gates are still, they have delays. And because they actually have delays, we must ensure that to have the proper operation of the flip-flop, we must ensure that, okay, that the signal has propagated from the D input inside okay the um, inside the master latch and this is why we have to have this ts to ensure that the uh, data input has propagated inside the master latch okay so this is why we should not really change the value of the data input during this short period of time before the arrival of the rising edge it also must hold even after the arrival of the rising edge. So this is the meaning of TS and TH. So in summary, we have seen that a sequential circuit has internal memory. We have seen that the output is a function of the current inputs and the present state. Okay, so it's not only a function of the current inputs, it's also a function of the present state. That's actually what makes sequential circuit different from combinational circuits. Now, the stored memory value defines the present state. So whatever we are storing inside the memory element, which is the flip-flop that we have seen so far, okay? So whatever we are storing inside the flip-flop will appear at the output of the flip-flop. And this is what defines the present state. Of course, you can use one or more flip-flops inside a sequential circuit. You can use many of these, okay? Uh, so their output, okay, their output values defines the present state. On the other hand, the next state, okay, appears at the input of the flip-flop. The next state means that, okay, it means that the value that we are going to store next inside the flip-flop, it appears at the input of the flip-flop. This can be computed based on the current inputs and the present state. We have seen two different types of sequential circuits. We have seen synchronous sequential circuits that use a clock. So we call them clocked sequential circuits. These are easier to understand, to analyze, to implement. So our focus in this course will be on the synchronous sequential circuits. But there is another type which is called asynchronous sequential circuits, and these are not really clocked. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go into uh, yeah, the uh, details of asynchronous sequential circuits, but we'll have like an example, like a ripple counter, which is an example of an asynchronous sequential circuit. We'll have a small example about that. There are two different types of memory elements that we have seen so far. We have seen latches and flip-flops. We have seen that latches are sensitive to the level of the clock, whereas flip-flops are sensitive to the edge of the clock. And for this reason, flip-flops are a better memory element than latches.
and they are actually used in synchronous sequential circuits. We can describe that we can have different types of flip-flops. The D type is the simplest, but we also have seen the JK and the T type. We can describe them with characteristic table and equation. That's it. This is the end of my uh, presentation and this is the end of my video. Thank you for watching.